Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Emmett, and thank you all for joining me here this evening. Um, so I'd like to take you through uh, an introduction to and a, a historical walk through the integration of the mass media and media devices into our domestic spaces. Because this wasn't in any way obvious to the people, say, who would have been sitting in the seats where you're seated now a hundred years ago. It would not yet have been clear that the air was itself going to become a medium that would be transmitting information into that most private of spheres, the home, the domestic sphere. And so we're going to talk about the role that remote controlled played in integrating media devices and media culture into our homes. And I want to start off with a remote control that you may see have seen in the hands of a six-month-old or a toddler, perhaps in your home or in somebody else's. This is the Fisher Price Laugh and Learn, Click and Learn remote. It was introduced in 2011. It's, you can still get it in Toys R Us or Target if you've got a mind. And uh, I first encountered this little sucker in 2012. Someone uh, bought it for a friend of mine who just had twin girls, and she hated this thing. It, um, it beeps, it lights up, it sings uh, 25 different songs or phrases, right? It's another of those noisy toys that children love so much. And she was like, why in the world would anybody buy my girls a pretend remote control? What is the point of this? And this was actually one of the moments where I first had the idea that I wanted to write a book about the history of remote control devices. Because I was like, well, I mean, it's, it's a technology, sure. But it's also, more importantly, a cultural fantasy, right? Learning how to use a remote control isn't just about figuring out which button does what. It's about figuring out how you live with the media. And that's precisely what this remote control teaches little children. Um, and I just want to point out one of the songs that it sings that seems really fascinating, really apropos for the discussion we're going to have today. Um, I've got a remote and I'm ready to roll, making things happen because I'm in control. And there, <laughs> there are a number of tensions in that little ditty that I want us to bear in mind as we think about where remote control came from and where it's taking us. And one of the first ones is, um, I'm ready to roll. How many of you have a remote control device on you right now? I might be the only one, right? We don't take our remote controls anywhere. For some reason, it's really important that they be mobile. Modal, actually, is the technical term. But they're not actually about motility or movement. They're about staying sedentary, right? The right to stay in one place, and then making things happen because I'm in control. Do remote controls actually make anything happen? I'm going to argue not, that in fact the remote control gives us an excuse not to exert power, that power and control are two different things, and remote controls absolve us of the need to make things happen or to exert power within our environment. And that's all very much bound up in the origin of the phrase remote control, which we'd probably think comes from some kind of electronics design think tank, right? Or maybe an advertising firm in New York City or Los Angeles. That's not actually the case. The term remote control was coined in 1794 when this guy, Thomas Hardy, was charged with high treason in London. So this isn't that Thomas Hardy. This isn't Tess Durbeville's Thomas Hardy, but it's still a very important Thomas Hardy. This Thomas Hardy was born in 1752, and he was one of the major players in the 1790s uh, British radical movement. And what these alleged radicals wanted really wasn't all that radical, right? What they were asking for was democracy, more power for parliament and less power for the king. 
I know, sounds shocking, right? But it felt really, really threatening to the British aristocracy in the 1790s. First of all, there was the American Revolution. They just lost one of their, were in the process of losing one of their most important colonies. And then just across the channel, there was the French Revolution, where folks were actually losing their heads, right? Probably uh, distant cousins of theirs were losing their heads to this whole parliamentary reform movement, to the people's demand for democracy. So the British aristocracy and the monarchy really wanted to crack down on calls for parliamentary reform from folks like Hardy. So in 1794, his prosecutor, Solicitor General Sir John Milford, suggested that what uh, Hardy was calling for, direct democracy or direct control by the people, could be contrasted with another democratic political principle that he called remote control. And what Milford meant by remote control was the control of people or institutions exercised at a distance. Basically, representative democracy, the kind of democracy that we have right now. You elect a congressman or a senator or a town selectman. They run on a platform that you approve, right, in voting for them. And then they go forward and vote on a bunch of bills that you don't have to pay that much attention to because they are your remote control over government. This was in contrast to direct democracy, which is what Hardy wanted, right? Which is something more like a town hall meeting. So my question, once I found out that remote control came from political theory, that seemed really fascinating to me. And I was like, OK, so be it. How did that get attached to the Apple remote or any of the other devices in my living room? And another really curious historical character becomes part of the story. And that is Nikola Tesla. So you've probably heard about Nikola Tesla. He was one of the two quote unquote inventors of electricity, discoverers of electricity might be a better way to put it. Tesla was also one of the early innovators of remote control devices, though he did not use that term. So this is about 100 years after Milford coined the term remote control. Tesla introduced a new device at the 1898 Electric Exhibition in New York City. And what it was was a small boat that could be uh, programmed or controlled from a distance by a separate set of gears that the controller would hold outside the water. And that sounds an awful lot like a toy car, right? I mean, we're used to this concept in theory. No one was used to it in theory or practice in 1898, and it was in no way a toy. 1898 is the era of the Spanish-American War, and the Spanish-American War was a huge cultural and government effort, and the entire electrical exhibition of 1898 was organized around war technologies. So remote control came back after 104 years as a way to think about war practice or the art of war. And in fact, it would play a really big role, not so much in the Spanish-American War, but in World War I. In World War I, the German Navy introduced a technology called the FL-7 boat, which was a full-size boat, but instead of having a crew, it had tons and tons of explosives. And it was connected by a 50 mile long cable to a controller either on land or on another ship in the Navy who would basically just ram this sucker into whatever it was the German Navy wanted to blow up. I guess us, mostly. And um, the FL-7s were incredibly successful. They were basically torpedo technology, and they inspired a number of imitation devices, attempts at, um, at remote-controlled flight. 
which we've succeeded at now. When you think about it, the drone is the direct descendant of the FL7, right? So at the same time that remote controls have started showing up in their living rooms, they also remain one of the most crucial tools of war. One of the things I want to point out, though, is that the phrase remote control doesn't often get attached to devices like the FL7 or drone warfare. Usually, we call the devices that we use to control drones controllers. And the same can be said of toy airplanes, toy cars, and video games. And I think it's worth pausing and asking, why are some of these things controllers and some of these things remote controls? Because we very rarely call remote controls controllers, right? The, the shortened term for a remote control is usually the remote. The first half of a compound noun is more important. And why is that? Well, a controller usually describes a device of movement, whether it's real movement, as in the case of a toy car, or virtual movement, as in the case of a, uh, a video game. But remote controls are, as I said, less about exerting power, less about creating an extension of your will in the universe, and they're more about remoteness. Right? And I think this has a lot to do with the moment at which remote controls became attached to media devices, which is the 1920s. So between the 1890s and the 1920s, we saw a huge change in what it meant to be remote. During the 19th century, media was only brought into the home through the active physical passage or carry of media by human beings, right? So we're thinking about pre-recorded records, novels, newspapers. People chose to bring these things into their house. But with the development of first telegraphy and then more importantly, the telephone and radio, all of a sudden the air itself was seeming to become a medium, and people were losing control over the remoteness of their house. As I'm sure you're all aware, we can't control when the telephone rings. It rings when someone else wants it to ring. We can't control when the radio is or is not receiving signals. We can turn it on or off, but the signals are always in the air all around us. And that felt really threatening, right? That really threatened the concept of the home that had been so dominant in the 19th century as a private sphere, a retreat from public interactions and the pressures, both commercial and political, of the marketplace, of the workplace. So the remote control was going to emerge as a media-invented device to solve a problem that the media created. You're not sure that you want radio in your house whenever radio wants to be operating? No problem. Just buy this extra attachment for your radio receiver, and you can reestablish a sense of control over your own house. You won't have power over the radio stations, but you will have a sense of control over when and how you listen to them. So now we're going to get to the graphic part of the talk, and I want to show you guys some advertisements for remote control technologies from the 1920s through the 1970s so that we can talk about the particular uh, anxieties, especially gender and class anxieties, that were operational in the design of remote control devices themselves and the way in which they were offered to the American public, the way in which the media both created a problem and solved the problem, seemed to solve the problem, through its own devices. All right. So what you're looking at now 
is a 1929 ad by the Colster Radio Corporation for the K45. This was the first radio receiver to include a remote control device. It sold for $500 at a time when the median cost of a radio in the a radio receiver in the United, United States was $139. So a Colster K45 cost about three and a half times as much as an equivalent radio. And um, for those of you trying to do the calculation in your head, it was about $7,300 in today's money. Yeah, right? I mean, can you imagine? You can't, I can't. You could get a car for that amount of money. So what did the Colster K45 have that other radios didn't have? That tiny little box in the upper left-hand corner was the key to it all. And um, this is pretty small print, so I'm going to read it for you at home. I'm sorry, at home. Ha. In, uh, in, the, in the rows in the back, so that we can talk about how the copy is directing us to interpret the image. So, an unnamed narrator says, quote, I tell you it was absolutely uncanny. We were sitting on the sun porch, and the Colster radio was in the library, two rooms away. Shall we have some music? I suggested. Surely, answered Mr. Jackson. But instead of walking way round into the library, he turned to an interesting device on the table beside him and pressed a button. What program do you want? Let's have the Colster Radio Hour, replied my wife. Jackson pressed another button, and the miracle happened. In a flash, the haunting melody of a Beethoven sonata came through the air. Why, it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And isn't that bizarre? This is an advertisement for radio. And the last line of the advertisement was, it's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and except for that little detail up in the left corner, can any of you guys even see the remote control? It's on a side table next to one of the two men in tuxedos on the right side of the image. But I think it is very much by design that the remote control is physically hard to pick out in this advertisement. This was not anomalous it, for late 20s, 1929, 1930, 1931 ads for remote control. The device itself was usually so well integrated into some kind of social or family scene that you'd have to look at it for a while to pick it out, which is interesting because this is what you're going to pay so much money for. Probably not, right? Whenever we buy electronics, we're not really buying a device. As I said, we're buying a cultural fantasy. So what is the cultural fantasy that we're seeing in it, this image? The first thing that stands out to me is class. These are incredibly affluent people, right? These are the kind of folks who sit around in tuxedos and evening dresses to listen to radio at home. Why would Colster even pretend that that was something that people did in 1929? Well, this is really interesting. So before the first broadcast radio station, NBC, was founded in 1926, radio was not a commercial enterprise. It was primarily an amateurist's hobby men and boys, because it was a very gendered hobby, built homemade radio receivers and sometimes transmitters from kits or from instructions that they would get in the back of a magazine, like Popular Science. And these kits would lead to devices that were really unsightly, right, and were often actually even physically messy. And they were very much associated with the working class, right? This was a popular pastime. And 
radio manufacturers, electronics companies like RCA, wanted to charge more for their radio devices. They wanted swells in tuxedos and evening dresses to spend $500 on radio receivers. So how are you going to do that? You need to give people the impression that radio isn't a hobby, that radio isn't working class, God forbid, that it's more about high culture, like Beethoven, that it's something people do in their spare time and that requires no effort, right? He pressed a button with his thumb. And in fact, it was so much a part of the scene of these high-class evenings that no one reading the Saturday Evening Post was probably ever actually going to, that you don't even need to see the remote control the device in the scene. So at this point, I started to think remote controls, even though they're all around us today, they started out as an aspirational norm. And what I mean by aspirational norm, another good example of an aspirational norm would be the 24-inch waist. Right, ladies? We've all been told that that is an ideal we're supposed to aspire to. That's what 17 and Cosmopolitan and the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue say should be a norm among women. It's not. We all know that. But it's an aspirational norm. And remote control was introduced by companies like RCA and Colster as an aspirational norm, right, as part of the class fantasy of the United States. But it only worked for so long to suggest that remote controls were worth $500 if nobody was going to look at them. So by 1932, you start seeing advertisements like this one by Stromberg Carlson for their Telector radio with remote. And what really strikes me about this advertisement is that whereas none of the figures in the previous Colster advertisement were looking at the remote control, both of the women in the Stromberg Carlson ad are looking right at the device which is no longer tucked off to the side, but in the middle of a white tablecloth. So I think what we're starting to see here is radio corporations um, embracing the concept that Thurston Veblen identified in 1899 as conspicuous consumption. Veblen was a sociologist. And he had noticed that the American upper class were starting to betray an interesting new habit of displaying their wealth through material possessions, right? That prior to that, it had been sufficient to have the right address, be from the right family. And in the, at the turn of the century, as we headed into the 20th century, showing how rich you were through what you could buy was becoming a very important part of American culture. And remote control had a role to play in that. It was no longer going to be just about power, what you could do, that you could make Beethoven appear in a flash. It would be about showing your power physically, putting the remote control in the middle of the scene, as it were, in the middle of your tea party. Now, the big irony here is that these things were actually pretty darn ugly, right? Take a look at that, uh, that detail up in the upper right image. The Telector remote was about 10 inches long. It had two rows of beige buttons set in an unglamorous sort of chocolate brown tin shell no scroll work, at least the Colster K45 had a little bit of scroll work around the edges, and it was attached to the radio receiver itself by a 17-foot-long cable that was about an inch thick, right? Like, this is as ugly as you can get in terms of electronics design. So I think you see there, again, this tension around conspicuous consumption, right? It was an aspirational norm. It was part of American culture by 1932. But we still had a very vexed relationship to it. We still have a very vexed relationship to class and display in this culture. The other thing I think is really important to note about the Stromberg Carlson ad is that it's two women 
remarking over remote control. Women appeared often in ads for electronics in the first half of the 20th century, even in the second half of the 20th century, and yet they were not often the target audience for the ads, right? This was not an ad that was aimed at women, actually, to say, hey, you might want to use some of your disposable income to go out and buy this device that's going to impress your girlfriends at your next tea party. The ad was aimed at men still. And this is actually about masculinity without any men being in the image itself. And the reason I'm going to argue that this is about masculinity is that women are there to make this unattractive device seem more attractive and easier to use. And this theme becomes even more obvious by the time we start looking at early television remote control ads such as this 1950 ad for the Lazy Bones. This was one of the first successful television remote controls. There were a couple other false starts before this, such as the Telezoom, which just made the image about an inch bigger than it would otherwise have been. And then um, the Manischewitz family, yes, that Manischewitz family, um, also invented a device called the Blab Off, which was about as successful as it was allowed to be coming from uh, outside the, the dominant electronics firms. The Lazy Bone was introduced by Zenith, however, which gave it a distinct market advantage over the Blab Off. And whereas the blab off, as you would guess by the name, was intentionally designed for the muting of commercials, the late phone had one button at first, second model had two buttons, and all it did was go up and down in channels. Now this is in 1950, when only a very few cities in the United States even got more than one or two channels, right? So again, we're going to come back to that idea of the aspirational norm. If all you get is ABC and NBC, why in the heck do you need another device on a 17-foot cable to help you switch back and forth between these two stations? Well, television, like radio, was presenting a real crisis to American norms. Whereas radio challenged people's ideas about what counted as the home and the home's relationship to the public culture, television was creating a crisis in gender norms. And the specific problem was around masculinity. So men are coming home from World War II, right, from a very active scene of battle that was in keeping with traditional American ideas about what it meant to be masculine, which was strong, physically capable, physically active, virile in a very physical sense. And they're coming home to an increasingly um, professionalized workplace, to a culture that was starting to value intellectual labor and the professions over physical labor, and also to an increasing emphasis on home life, right? Rather than going to a pub or a private club after work, culture was telling men to go back to the suburbs, that new phenomenon, and stay home in the evening with their wife and children and watch the quote-unquote boob tube. So in order to sell this new fantasy life, in order to sell this new cultural norms, the television manufacturers had to figure out a way to make watching television masculine again. And the remote control was one of the key ways in which they did that. Again, this had less to do with how many people actually bought or used remote controls. Remote controls were only sold with about 10% of uh, color television sets in the 60s and 1% of black and white sets, and more to do with what people would think about television when looking at advertisements like this in publications like the Saturday Evening Post. So let's just read the caption again for a second and let it help us interpret the image. Click, 
You switched to the TV program of your choice without stirring from your easy chair. With Zenith's amazing Lazy Bones remote, there's no more jumping up and down to walk to and from your set. No more waiting through dull TV moments for the sparkling entertainment that follows. To change stations, you just press lightly with your thumb, and presto, there's the program that you want. If we pair that direct address to you with the image, the person with the remote control is the father in this scene, right? It was always the father. He's holding the remote while mother and junior sit next to him, just riveted by, I have to say, a pretty boring looking chamber music performance, right? A singer and a piano. And Junior seems to have abandoned his comic books on the floor. Is he suddenly overcome with a love for chamber music? This seems unlikely to me. Between the caption and the image, it seems to me far more likely that we're supposed to think that Junior is riveted by his father's display of control over the image right? That his father is now becoming an, uh, an icon of masculinity for him, that he's impressed by his father, even though his father is no longer physically active, not even getting up and walking across the room to change this television station. Instead, remote control was becoming a new way for America to understand masculinity. And that's very well dramatized in this Zenith ad for the first wireless remote control. This is the Space Command. It was introduced in 1956. Um, and this is actually the second Space Command. The first one only had one tuning bar in it, could only send the channel up or down. This one has the amazing ability to um, lower volume, advance channels, and turn the set on or off. And this is where the term clicker came from, for those of you who are wondering. The first wireless remote controls, or I should say the first successful wireless remote controls, use tiny ultrasonic tuning rods within the device. And when you pressed a button, a little hammer would hit that tuning rod. And that was the click that people heard that gave remote controls the nickname, the clicker. And needless to say, drove the, the household dog insane. So that's an interesting trivia uh, fact, but what really fascinates me and what I think is so important about this advertisement is the competing visions of masculinity that we see within it. So we've got three very iconic American cowboys on the television set right, staring, I think, kind of menacingly back at either the, uh, the reader, the person reading the advertisement, or at the man holding that remote control device. And what stands out to me about this guy, other than his, his race, and we should probably just pause here a second to note that it was always and exclusively Caucasians in advertisements for remote control devices, is the cuff of his shirt white, right? It's a white shirt. It's a white collar masculinity that is about to literally change the channel on these cowboys, on the history of the masculine ideal in the United States, that the white collar worker was now going to take control of what it meant to be masculine in the United States through his buying power. Right? Because it's very important here to me, again, also, that there's no family scene here. There are no women, there's no girlfriend, there's no wife and children. It's just the man with the remote control and the men that he's exerting his control over. And that was really new. Because another crisis that was facing American masculinity, at least for advertisers in the mid-century, was if masculinity had previously been associated with probity and thrift, right? Men didn't shop. Men hate to shop. Men like to go out and do stuff. How are you going to get them to buy electronics, right? How are you going to get them to buy aftershave? How are you going to get them to buy socks, 
And so one of the things that this ad captures so brilliantly is showing men a way in which their consuming power is going to shore up a new vision of American masculinity, a new way to be a man's man, that being high tech could be something that you do for you, for your sense of self, not just to impress Junior or your wife or your future wife. And that takes us pretty directly into the ascension of remote controls from an aspirational norm to a norm in fact. Remote controls finally crossed the 50% line in American households in 1985. And there were two factors that led to the rise of remote control. The first one was the success of LEDs light-emitting diodes, those little, you know, red buttons uh, at the end of your remote control, which is how the remote control is able to use infrared frequencies to communicate with your electronics. And the other was the VCR. So this is a 1980 advertisement for the Sony Betamax. And uh, just for background, for those of you who either didn't give a fuss about the remote control or um, home video technologies in the 1980s, and those of us who might not have been born yet, Betamax was actually the first format of half-inch videotape to be sold to the American market. It was introduced in 1975, VHS came in 1976, and they duked it out in a format war for 10 years before VHS finally hammered Betamax out of the US marketplace. The success of VHS actually had nothing to do with remote control technology. But remote controls were one of the many devices that Betamax and VHS used against each other during the format war. And this is a really interesting advertisement for the way in which remote control helped people conceive of why they would want to spend $1,000 on a device that was about the size of your average television set these days, right? Look at it the same size as the television set even in 1980. Look at the size of that sucker. So what these VCRs were said to do was called time shifting. And that's not an expression that we use for video anymore, or at least not very often. But that was how Sony described pause, fast forward, rewind, and record in the 70s and 80s. It was the power to shift time. Their first slogan for their VCR was watch whatever, whenever. VCR technology wasn't going to be about being able to go to Blockbuster and rent a pre-recorded cassette of Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was supposed to be about your ability to record television at one moment and watch it at the moment that it suited you. And by attaching remote control to this fantasy of power, I mean, what is more aggrandized? What is the bigger delusion of, of grandeur than the ability to shift time? And that might be why Betamax called their remote control here the Time Commander, right? Like, <laughs> it's quite a name for a small chunk of plastic and a few microchips. So you might be able to see at the top of the Time Commander there, in order to pack all of this power into an itty-bitty little device, the, uh, the Sony Corporation had to temporarily abandon the fantasy of wireless remote, right? That you were going to walk all over the stage or your neighborhood or your, even your living room with a device in your hand and go back to wired remote. But they did something really canny with this seeming hurdle. Where is that wire actually going? Right? We, don't, we don't see a television set or a VCR in this advertisement. It's off there to the right. But in the main image, it might be the source of light behind Mr. Time Commander. But we can't really, we'd have, we're guessing there, right? So the, the cable coming off of the top of the remote control seems to be going into his arm. <laughs> 
That was my first assumption when I saw this image, that it's creating a kind of cyborg masculinity, that this guy is so high-tech, he's so in control, that he is actually becoming one with his machinery. And we think about films like uh, RoboCop or The Terminator. This is a really popular fantasy for masculinity in the 1980s. The men weren't just going to be hard bodies in the sense of having hard muscles, but were also going to be hard bodies in the sense of hard technology, of being integrated with a high-tech future, right? That yuppie masculinity, which now needed to replace the man in the gray flannel suit. So I mentioned that by 1985, remote controls were in over 50% of US households. From there, it was a really slippery slope. By 1990, they were in uh, the majority of US households, and the majority of US households had four or more remotes. Right In my living room right now, I have a remote control for the air conditioner in the window. I have a remote control for the ceiling fan overhead, remote control for the television set, remote control for the cable box, remote control for the Apple TV. The list goes on and on. So remote controls went from being an aspirational norm to a norm to a problem in a space of about 10 years. And this presented a really interesting challenge for electronics designers. And I want to really briefly now walk you through the way in which designers responded to these challenges. So we're coming up to the present moment. How our remote controls are exerting control over a problem they created in our living rooms today. So here are the first two solutions that electronics manufacturers offered us for remote control clutter. Surprise, the answer to remote control clutter is another remote control. It's amazing. The one on the left is a RCA digital command center. This was the first branded remote. And by branded remote, what we mean is a remote control that could work with every product in the RCA line. And it was supposed to offer you, as so many devices did, total control. In this case, they called it total control over the theater of life. And the only thing you have to do to get total control over the theater of life is cede total control of your living room to RCA, right? The, uh, the di digital command center could work with a television, a VCR, a radio receiver, a CD player, a record player, and um, a cassette player. But they all had to be RCA. Sorry about that. Ooh. <laughs> Some people didn't like that. Some people didn't necessarily think RCA was the cutting edge across all of those different fields of electronics. Some people wanted to cherry pick just the right VCR for them, right? Just the right CD player for them. And for these folks, we had what was called the universal remote, although at the time it was distinguished as a learning remote. And on the right-hand side there, you'll see the first universal remote. It's called the CL9, or the core, and it was actually designed by Steve Wozniak the engineer who designed the Apple I and the Apple II computers. And it was called a learning remote because you could program the core to replace any of your infrared remote control devices, right? It could learn the commands of any other remote control. The problem, and I say this as an educator, the problem with learning is that you have to teach people or remotes, as the case may be. How many of you have actually programmed the quote unquote pre-programmed universal remote controls that came with any of the devices in your home media center, right? I hadn't until I actually decided to write a book about the history of remote control devices. And frankly, I only got halfway through the process because it's a pain in the butt. <laughs> 
And those are so-called pre-programmed universal remotes. The core could control any device. It wasn't pre-programmed at all. So it was way more complicated than the universal remotes that we're even used to. Needless to say, the core died within two years of its introduction on the market. But the concept or the cultural fantasy of the universal remote stayed with us. That's why I have no less than three universal remotes in my home at the moment. And then last but not least, we had the simplified remote. So whereas the core reflected what might be called designer or engineer-focused design, right? It reflected how the core, as a learning remote, actually worked, right? All of the different pages, um, A through D up top, and the various commands that you could assign to different pages. Happy to explain if anyone actually wants to know. This is what we would call user-centered design. Looking at an Apple remote tells you nothing about how an Apple remote actually works. It doesn't tell you anything about the electronic programming guide that it's designed to interface with, or the way in which electronic programming guides radically altered our understanding of television, how television went from being a series of linear flows, right? Like the good old days of must-see TV on Thursday night at NBC, where you had one show after another. Instead, right now, we're quite used to database approaches to television, right? Whether that database is iTunes or the electronic programming guide that lets you show what, that shows you what is on when and lets you record what you want on your DVR. So simplified remote controls were another solution to remote control clutter and to the confusion of remote controls that the core and other universal remotes created. But as an electronics industry solution to a, to a problem created by the electronics industry, they don't actually offer us any more control over the situation, right? Even though you now may feel like you have far more choice than you ever had before. The remote control is not actually giving you any more power over the media. You can choose what show you want when you want to watch it, and it may feel like it was designed for your hand, and it was designed to fit your hand much better than prior remotes had been. But I want to argue that these are illusions of control that actually mask the amount of power that we've handed to the media industries in the name of convenience and motility, movement, freedom that we don't even use. Thank you very much, everyone. Time. We have time for a few questions, if you'll raise your hand. Also, uh, her book, Remote Control, will be on sale in the lobby after this, and she'll be signing books. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, so I'm curious about, it seems from like my remote, where the next phase is the uh, voice command. Mm -hmm. and. I wonder, it feels like it's sort of democratizing in a way, right? There's no like beautiful phallic-like thing that the dad can hold. And I'm wondering if ah. you see that as a possibility. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so that was actually, I'm glad you brought that up. That was the slide that I ran out of time for. So um, we've got two examples of voice command remote control here. The Google Home, which I admit Google is selling as a smart speaker. But when paired with uh, Chromecast or various other programs, also functions like a remote control. And the other one is an Xfinity XR11 remote control. This is one of those so-called universal remotes that um, you could program to work with any of your devices, and I at least haven't yet. So people have been arguing for quite a while that voice command was going to phase out remote control devices. But in fact, almost no electronics manufacturers 
put the microphone for voice command in the hub itself, right? It's not in your television set. It's not in your computer. It's in a Google Home or a remote control. Why is that? One, it's still really easy to lose remote control devices. And I hope none of you have ever lost one of your cable box remotes because the bill is astronomical. <laughs> So there's an advantage to the electronics manufacturers of putting voice command in these devices. The other thing that's really interesting is that I see your point about it. It seems democratizing, but it actually creates a lot of the same problems that we've recently seen um, with Facebook about sharing user profile and user information. So regarding the XR11, uh, if, you, if you spend enough time on this, you'll find a web page where Comcast says, quote, the, the, the voice commands that you uh, speak into your XR11 are, quote, sent to Comcast and its contracted service provider for processing to improve Comcast's products and services and to improve voice recognition algorithms. I confess, I had the impression that when I was speaking into my remote control, my voice commands were just being processed in the cable box, and that they, it was just sending me to Turner Classic Movies or what have you, and that was the end of the story. Not so much. Like Facebook, like Google, all of the voice commands that we are offering these devices are being stored and used for the consumer data that they can offer. So it might be democratizing in the sense that if um, for certain kinds of, of physical impairments, having voice command is much more useful, right? If you have um, arthritis in your hands, for example, some of these remote controls are incredibly unuser friendly or user unfriendly. But at the same time, it's also offering more power to the electronics manufacturers and media companies than it is offering extra control to us. Great question. Thank you. Um, so if the remote control is basically um, like what you said, a, a means of ceding power uh, to media in the name of convenience. What's the alternative? What can consumers do to, to um, gain more control over the media that we interface with, that enters our homes, that becomes part of our lives? Like, what is the flip side to? Um, your argument. What can we do as consumers? Great. So one of the things I, um, I, I say to my students when they ask me questions like that is, well, what would be the most inconvenient for you? And they're like, I don't know, like, you know, maybe like tweeting at them that like, I really didn't like the fact that I can fast forward through keeping up with the Kardashians, but I can't fast forward through the commercials in keeping up with the Kardashians. And I was like, yeah, yeah, tweeting at them would, would waste your time calling them would be even worse, right? Whatever is, is less convenient, is more active, is going to provide the kind of feedback that is more likely to have an effect on how these devices are actually designed in the way in which they're offered to us. For instance, there used to be a replay button. Actually, you can still see it. They've taken it away, though. The replay button on the XR11, which rewinds television by 15 seconds, and they've removed it because people didn't understand what the replay what button was, and they were calling Comcast and saying, my television is skipping, and they're like, it's digital. It can't skip. Um, but but the, there was a response to consumer feedback and to complaint. And so I think that making your voice heard actually out loud on the telephone is the most effective means of conveying to media corporations or to elected officials that you don't like what they're doing and the power that they're exerting over you. I think he'd like to, to give you the microphone for recording purposes. That's awful. <laughs> um, I love the 15-second thing, and you're saying, <laughs> I can't get it anymore? 
<laughs> um, okay, that's they, I, that's I, not I, user friendly. <laughs> <laughs> None of this is user friendly when you get right down to it. For instance, they have known, it's interesting that the replay button is being removed by Comcast. And if you have a different um, cable provider, you might be holding on to your replay button for a little bit longer. The electronics manufacturers have been aware since the 90s that folks don't use most of the buttons on their remote controls. Some industry journalists refer to buttons like um, setup or info as vestigial buttons because sort of like nipples on men, they served an evolutionary purpose maybe at one point, but it's been a long time. <laughs> Yet they also know that while we don't use them, we like the look of them. So setup, info, et cetera, stay there, not because they're useful, but because market research suggested that people liked the feeling that they got from having an illusion of interactivity, right? That we may not want to use those buttons, but we want to know we could if we chose to. So again, I'd say if you like replay, the solution is to call, well, it may or may not turn out to be a solution, but what I would recommend is to call these companies and be part of the market survey that they may or may not have been intending to run that day. Anybody else? So I actually have a quick question. I'm really fascinated about the um, gendered history of remote controls, and I bet it's not something I ever thought about. Um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit about the tendency of things like Google Home and Alexa and Siri to always have like a female voice or a female persona. Uh-huh. That's a great question. And actually, I just want to uh, give a shout out to a former student of mine at Georgetown who did her uh, senior honors thesis on the question of the gendering of automated voices. And again, it comes back to market research and to observations, which actually go back to the teens and 20s, that people find female voices less intimidating than male voices. So the first telephone operators were actually men. It was a male-dominated industry, which makes sense when you think about how we associate new technology with masculinity. But people didn't react well to being confronted by a male operator on the telephone asking them where they wanted their call to be connected to. A female voice was considered more subservient, friendlier, and less intimidating to people who were getting used to a new technology. So uh, my student argued, I think quite convincingly, that, um, that when it comes to call centers, when it comes to um, automated mechanical voices like Alexa or like Siri, there's a long technological history and unfortunately a sort of patriarchal history of associating women with subservience and thus with technological subservience. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Let's get another round of applause for her presenter. Thank you. Again, the book is on sale in the lobby, and she'll be signing copies. Thank you for attending, and please enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.